Okay, so um, thank you everyone for attending. I'm uh, super excited to be here. I flew all the way from Paris, France uh, to be here today. Uh, okay, so my name is Jerome. I work for a company called Oanda. Uh, we do, uh, we're Toronto based, we're a technical shop. We do Forex trading online. Um, we run our own forex trading platform. Uh, it's a market that's a couple of uh, trillion dollar per day in uh, in volume. So if that kind of stuff is uh, of any interest to you, we're uh, we're hiring. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's uh, talk about the HTML5 games and uh, behavior driven development. So let's start by a quick show of hands. Um, how many people here uh, develop video games as a hobby or um, uh, as a li for a living? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Right crowd, right crowd. Uh, how many people have heard about uh, behavior-driven development before, or BD for short? Two people that were creative? Okay, a couple people. <laughs> and uh, how many people actually use this uh, on a daily basis at work, on a personal project? Okay. <laughs> uh, good, so what is it exactly? Well, BDD um, is an enabler. It's a methodology that's going to help you write better, faster, uh, sorry, better application, uh, more reliable application faster. Um, and my mind already went blank. Good. Uh, why is that? Why is that? Oh, well, right. Yes, you start by writing a test um, that under certain conditions, your application exhibit uh, certain behaviors. Then you implement this test by uh, writing as little code as possible. And you repeat the process until you're basically done with building your application. Um, so I'm talking about spending time writing tests to save some time. So that, that's not like intuitive. But um, let me ask you this. Why do cars have brakes? Anybody want to take a guess? Why do cars have brakes? Well, they have brakes so they can go faster. Does it make sense? Well, think about this. If cars didn't have brake, you would be driving 10 kilometers per hour in, uh, in fear of hitting something and killing yourself. The brakes help you to stop, and it gives you the confidence that even though you're driving faster, you can react in time and avoid an accident. BDD is about the same thing. Um, pretty much, the test suite that you're gonna be building um, is gonna set a, base uh, a baseline for all the core behaviors that you want your application to exhibit and you will be able to run that test suite reliably, automatically, and as often as you want. Um, so basically, that's, that's your safety net. Um, it is also some good self, uh, uh, benefits, like self-documentation. Um, your, your test suite is gonna be written in plain English. It's gonna describe exactly what your application is supposed to be doing not how it's implemented, that's not important. You and I can come with different implementation of exactly the same thing. What matters is what is it supposed to, to be doing. Um, and it's also going to capture every single decision you make along uh, the way of your project because you're gonna write tests for them. So the technical spec might go out of date, um, your, your comments in the code, uh, you might have trouble extracting that. Well, your test suite is gonna be all you need because it's always gonna be up to date. And finally, I found that uh, personally, when I write a test first, it forces me to structure my code better, to make it more modular, to use design patterns so it's easier to test, and I just end up writing less code and more simpler code. So that keeps most of the bugs at bay. So why don't we apply this to uh, video games more? Well, video games are so geared toward entertainment. They're so different from our regular applications that we tend to forget one critical piece. They are just a piece of software. So whatever best practice works for serious industries also apply. This is actually a quote from GLADOS at the beginning of Portal 2, and I say, hell yes, make her do the work. Write the test and let computers run them for you. Don't, don't, do the, don't run the test yourself. Um, you're gonna just free yourself to spend more time building your app this way. When it comes to video game development, everybody wants to dive right in and like build gorgeous 3D engines because that's what players see first, that's what's cool. But really, I find this is not really important. Nobody wants to be this guy. Nobody wants to be holding the ruler and the damage table and figuring out, well, can this unit move here? Who shot who? But that's really what's important. If, if those rules are broken, your game is gonna suck big time, no matter how awesome it looks. So, how do we do about uh, writing tests for, uh, for, uh, for games? Well, what is your game design document, essentially? if not a collection, a rule book, a collection of all the rules and game mechanics that 
uh, makes define your game and that you also need to implement to build your game. So pretty much your game design document becomes your test suite. One rule, a couple of tests. As simple as that. So I'm going to walk you through an example by building a web-based version of the Simon game. Um, Simon game is, uh, game design is pretty simple. At the beginning of the game, uh, Simon has a color sequence that's completely empty and we're on turn zero. Um, at the beginning of every turn, Simon will pick one random color between yellow, blue, red, and green um, and add it at the end of its sequence. Then it's going to replay the entire sequence and it's going to be the player turn. Using those tiles, it's going to try to match exactly uh, the sequence in the same order. Uh, if he succeeds, we move on to the next turn. As soon as he makes a mistake, game over. So um, I'm going to use a framework called uh, Mocha.js. Uh, it's a JavaScript framework, but pretty much all the testing frameworks are kind of organized around um, like the describe keyword and the it keyword. Um, so it's going to go like this. I'm going to say, on game start, uh, I'm going to test that Simon's call sequence uh, is empty, and the, the turn is actually zero. So you usually structure your test case around uh, four different parts. Arrange your data, act on it, make as many assertions as, as you need to check that the behavior has been observed, and restore the data if uh, restore the state if you need to. Um, since this is the very first test case I write, there is no arrange uh, section. I'm just going to act on it by creating an instance of my Simon game. Um, and then I can run my assertion that there's going to be a sequence object that's, a that's I expect to be a list that is, that is empty as a length of zero. And that if I call the get turn function, I, I end up with, uh, with zero as well. As a matter of fact, that test case doesn't even load because I just got started. So my application is absolutely nothing. I don't have that Simon object I'm trying to instantiate. So I'm going to write the bare amount of code re required to move forward, which is just defining an empty function uh, called Simon. And now my test case runs, and it fails. It's actually a good thing. You do want your test to fail first. Otherwise, you have no way to actually figuring out if, to measure if uh, the code you're writing is actually making any impact. Um, so the failures there are pretty obvious. There is no. Um, sequence object, so it's undefined and I cannot call a shoot on it, and I don't have a get turn method. Well, again, I'm going to write the bare amount of code. Do I have? Yes, okay. Yes, no. Um, I seem to be missing a slide there for some reason. No, no, actually, no, it's good. Um, right, so yes, so I'm going to define, like in, in the Simon object, that's a, the, the constructor, I'm going to initialize the sequence to, uh, to an empty uh, array, and I'm going to define the get turn function by saying, by tying it to the sequence. This way, um, if there's five colors in the sequence, I'm on, uh, round, uh, on, I'm on turn five. And finally, it passed. Good. Um, so now I'm going to move on to its Simon turns, what should be happening. So when it's Simon turns, um, I'm going to call, I'm going to design my code so I, when I call it, I'm going to call the next turn function and that's going to trigger stuff. Um, and I'm going to assert that Simon did pick up color, uh, a color randomly and that it added it at the end of its sequence. So here I'm going to have to arrange my data a bit. So I'm going to create uh, the Simon object and I'm going to use the, uh, the Swiss army knife of uh, behavior, development, uh, uh, behavior driven development testing um, in JavaScript, sign on .js. Awesome library, check it out. Um, so what this, is, what this line is going to allow to, me to do is it's going to decorate the pick random color function and it's going to trigger it, but also record every, use, uh, every kind of useful stuff, like how many times it's been called, uh, with what kind of argument it's been called. And with that, then I can act and say new turn, and my assertions are going to, are going to look like what, uh, did the pick random color function got called one and only once? Uh, and uh, does the sequence have now a length of one? Um, as it turned out, it still doesn't load. Um, well, so that's a technicality of uh, sign on JS. You can only decorate a method that actually exists. So I'm going to define an empty pick random function uh, to uh, keep it happy. And since the code is going to call the new turn uh, function, it's also going to complain that it doesn't exist. Um, so again, empty function. So now it runs and fails properly. Um, 
Pickering and color was not called, and the sequence is still empty. Therefore, I can now implement some stuff. I'm going to say, I'm going to call pick random color and push the result at the end of the sequence. And now it passed. Great. Or, really? What? I haven't really defined pick random color, so how come, how come something got added? That's weird. Well, I'm going to add an extra test case saying, I really want to make sure that what I put in my sequence is valid colors. So I'm going to say, well, blue, red, yellow, or, or green, that's, that's uh, if I look at the element I've just added, it should be one of those. Um, and now it fails with, a, with an explanation, undefined. Since my function is empty, it returns undefined, so it does return something, and it gets added to the sequence, but I'm just, it, Simon's just putting garbage in the sequence. So armed with that test, I can now implement pick random function, blue. Awesome, that's the bare amount of code that I need to write to make the, make the test pass. And yes, it's dumb, but it actually um, helps me to make two cases. Uh, uh, first, write the bare amount of code that's required for the test to pass, and like the game is gonna work as well. It's gonna be boring, because it's always blue, but the player doesn't know that, so it's fine. Um, well, until uh, uh, up to one point. And the second is that it, the point is not to, to get 100% coverage of your code. That would just be wasteful. You would not get the benefit of BDD. You, you have to test what you think is important to you. And again, I didn't test that pick random uh, color was fair because I'm going to use math random to do, um, to do that uh, random pick. And like, I've got no other way than trust that it is fair in the first place. So I don't care so much what the function returns. What I care is that what get added at the end of, uh, in the sequence is actually a proper color. So that's what the test is for, and I won't write anything about uh, fairness. So I'm going to move. A I'm going to fast forward a bit. I just repeat the same principle over and over again on, on all the assignment rules. But so far, like I'm, I'm, my application just looks like, like a blank page. My test passed, yes, but I still don't have a game. So um, you can actually. Uh, also write tests for user interface, and this is an example. So let's fast forward to the moment where it's the player, player's turn. He's gonna cl click on a color tile, um, and, and again, I don't need my test suite to run on the actual full page that could have like ads and many, many other things. Th this is the bare amount of markup that I need for it to pass. I'm just gonna say, there's gonna be four dev with an ID of blue, red, uh, green, and yellow. They have a class button so they look nice, and that's where the clients, is, the, the player is gonna uh, click. So using jQuery, I'm gonna make this fake markup. Um, well, all the markup that really will end up in, in the page. I'm gonna give that to Simon so it does some interesting thing on it. Um, I'm gonna spy on the method uh, called player click. So here, um, it's just a spy. It, it, it won't trigger anything yet. That, that will be for the next test case where I'll, I'll implement it. Right now, I just want to make sure that like, when a click happens, when a player finds the blue tile and click on it, then that Simon is told that the player, yes, the player clicked, and what color, the, the, the player, um, what color was the tile that the player clicked. Um, so that's how you do it. Pick the call, uh, uh, player clicked, call count equal one, and then you look at the first call of, uh, of that was recorded in the spy, you look at the first argument, and it should be blue. Failing again. Oh, no, it's a good thing, seriously. Okay, and then this is all I need to do to uh, make that test case pass. I, in the constructor of Simon, I'm gonna look at my page, find all the, the button, uh, all the div elements with a class of button. I'm gonna attach a, um, a callback to the click event and say when, when that happened, call a player clicked on my game and take the uh, HTML elements and return its ID. And bam, it finally passed. So, Using this, pretty much, you can test the UI, you can test the game mechanics. If you apply this, um, this is actually what you can build. Um, so I've used uh, BDD all the way to, to write this. Um, it's actually, the code is actually available on my GitHub account. So there's, I've, uh, I've made one commit for a test case, then the next commit is the implementation, and so on and so on. Um, and at the beginning, it looks very crappy, and at the end, I just put some nice CSS, and it looks like the Windows logo, Windows 7. Fred, why did you have to change the logo in Windows 8? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, I don't even know what color is. Oh, game over, okay. Um, 
Okay, so again, like if you want to look at uh, the full game and see how the progression goes, um, my GitHub account, GitHub slash J E R L E 76 Simon Game. Um, the tools that I've been using, Mocha, BDD Test Framework, Jasmine also exists. Um, ChaiJS, that's um, the library that, tell, that allows me to write my assertion, not like in the classic assert equal true, but um, should this, this uh, does this thing, this thing should equal that. Uh, there's also another form that's expect. I expect this thing to be equal to. Uh, the test just uh, the, the test itself just reads better. Uh, sign in JS, so you can spy, mock, uh, stub. You can also uh, make fake, a um, well, respond to AJAX queries and also create fake timer and advanced time to trigger some uh, set timeouts or set uh, set intervals that your code might might have. Yeoman is a nice um, like boiler, project boilerplate that, that uh, gives you some templates and set up a lot of tools. And then Grand.js is the, the make file of JavaScript that, that runs uh, this project. And uh, well, this is pretty much what I've got so far. So this is how you can get rid of, uh, reach of me. Um, my email at Wanda, my Twitter account, my GitHub account. And uh, I would just love to hear your uh, feedback on the BDD and how you use it, your experience and, and whatnot. So if you have any questions, shoot. Questions? Does anybody have any questions at all? Any comments? Okay, good. So I expect BDD to be used in all your projects from now on. Uh, okay. And then, uh, I have a couple of uh, promotional Wanda pen. You can swim by uh, the table over there, and uh, and I will give you some. Thank you very much. <laughs>